Hello, all you homo sapiens. Welcome back, or welcome to the show. Today I'd like, if I may, to take you on a strange journey. Shock treatment. A wacky little thing that happened. It sure did. And not only was kind of ahead of its time in some ways, but was a pretty big flop at the time, and oddly enough was part of an attempt at making a sequel of sorts to the cult success of The Rocky Horror Picture Show. So me being the deep-minded philosopher who cares way too much about stuff everyone has forgotten about, had to get to the bottom of this bizarre little thing. I just, I just had to. <laughs> Join me as we find out how the Rocky Horror Picture Show sequel, but also not sequel, but before we get into that, how about some context? The Rocky Horror Picture Show came out two years after the musical it was based on started in the West End of London, featuring some of the same cast members, including Richard O'Brien, who not only had the role of Riff Raff, my personal favorite, THEY DIDN'T LIKE ME! THEY NEVER LIKED ME! But he also wrote the stage show. Now the story seemed to focus largely on the progression of rock and roll, taking on more of an androgynous, flamboyant look and style. Thanks to the hippie movement in the 60s, promoting free love and rebelling against conformity, the movie focused on the traditions and idealistic relationships and stereotypical gender roles of the 50s, heavily satirized that idea until the couple stumbles across a spooky wooky gothic castle representing the progressive change between the 50s now time I'm warping into the 70s, where chaos ensues and the silent generation faint in shock and horror as their parents did in the early 50s when they were teens getting into the start of rock and roll. It's a never-ending cycle. It also blended all these LGBT and counterculture themes and expressing your true self with a plot inspired by early horror and science fiction films of the 30s through the 50s, and I think that connection makes a lot of sense, as the horror genre is often looked down on as being this taboo, strange thing. Like something you feel you're not supposed to watch, despite feeling the urge to look anyway. For instance, Frankenstein's monster is feared based on looking different than everyone else, but he's actually just deeply misunderstood. We belong dead. Nothing was ever explicitly put in the text back then, but it did lead to some slight undertones that not everyone's the same and that they still have their own place. Rocky Horror had more of a modern take on this compared to the 30s, kind of embracing being an outcast in a louder way, which helped it to connect with an audience of people who also felt that they were misfits. Well, how about that? And also, representation like this wasn't really around much back then. Uh, though, uh, to be honest, I do think some of this stuff is uh, kind of outdated, uh, very much a product of its time. I think some of it sends uh, mixed signals. <laughs> Some interesting mixed messages, I should say. I mean, Frank is supposed to be this villain. He murders Eddie, who represents everyone's nostalgia for pre-established rock and roll. He forced himself onto Brad and Janet, and Rocky, who I don't think was aware of anything that was happening. But then by the end, you're supposed to sympathize with Frank and relate to him. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I swear, this movie is like a conflicting taste in my mouth. Like, this is good? Question mark? Maybe. It's certainly unique, and I think some of it is genuinely cool and has its place in queer history and horror and comedy musicals, which is a niche subgenre that is very lacking. The music is memorable, Tim Curry was perfect for the role, and Meatloaf, may he rest in peace. I'm a sweet transvestite! Eventually, the film was turned into a tribute TV remake in 2016 called The Rocky Horror Picture Show Let's Do the Time Warp Again, which was part of the trend of live TV musicals, though this one was not live, and yet it tried to capture the feeling of watching it live with an audience of fans who loved the original. It's certainly a mixed match of bland performances, minus a couple. I, I did really like the new take on Columbia's character. <laughs> in the devil's eyes. My favorite aspect, though, is all the sets. There's more color, and the design is quite an improvement over the main pink room. The budget was higher, even with factoring inflation. They do show off more of the rooms of the castle, including a fucking sex dungeon. Tim Curry also came for the part of the narrator, and even that was somehow not able to fix the train wreck of awkwardness, as they try to make rape more sanitized. Everything's going to be all right. 
I don't know why they thought this would work, but it was a thing. It did happen, and I could go on for another 29 minutes talking about its failure. No, that's not the failure we're here to talk about, is it? Shock, Shock treatment. treatment. After Rocky Horror was released in England in August of 75, then released in the States the following month, uh, it did uh, not great at first, with early daytime screenings and playing as a double feature along with Brian De Palma's Phantom of the Paradise, which I still love so fucking much. Tons of fun, yet is very tragic also. I still think it's better than Rocky Horror also. And it wasn't until the following year, once they reached out to other distributions to play it during midnight screenings, that it started to gain a cult following from the underground crowd, which makes a lot of sense for the kind of film that it is. And so as that fan base grew and people started really getting into the whole phenomenon by dressing up and turning it into a celebration, kind of like a fun little event for the weekends, I swear you listen to some of the interviews that were done during this time where people were like talking about going and seeing it like hundreds of times and you're like, oh, oh shit, they've only seen it 375? Well, this one saw it 792 like come on and tonight's my 350th time 302 times 267 times Another big thing that they started doing during these late night screenings was holding competitions to see who the best cosplayer was. People would go and participate over and over again and were craving for more, hungry with anticipation for a sequel. All of this carried on while behind the scenes in 1978, Richard started working on a follow-up story for a film originally titled Rocky Horror Shows His Heels. The plot would have centered around Frankenfurter being resurrected by virgin blood and traveling back to Denton and discovering that Janet is now pregnant with his child. He also tries to trick the town into converting into his new cult of Transylvanians by sprinkling them with fairy dust, thereby transforming them into transsexuals. No, I am not making this shit up. <laughs> Magenta and Riff Raff then acted as the foils to his plans once again by kidnapping Frank's child and destroying him in the last act because he needed more pints of blood from virgin boys and then the spell breaks on the town and then the end <laughs> now doesn't that just sound like fucking incredible ah geez unfortunately that never ended up coming into fruition supposedly because tim curry just didn't want to do a sequel but the studio really insisted that they wanted him to come back and reprise his role leading to the project being dropped and never continued but richard didn't give up there he rewrote the script and revised some of the music under the working title of the brad and janet show which eventually morphed into shock treatment they began production in 1980, and then there was a writer's strike that started in America, leading them to go and film everything on a soundstage in England. Luckily though, this wasn't too much of a problem because they made use of what they had and decided to make the TV studio the predominant location, with all the cutaways being other shows and advertisements for the network. Soon they had the cast all sorted out, some returned, some were left out, and some were replaced, either due to not reaching a salary agreement or because their career careers were just going in separate directions, and they were kind of just not interested in doing another one of these, skeptical towards how audiences would have reacted this time around. Which was wise, because once Shock Treatment was released straight to midnight screenings on Halloween night 1981, hoping to reach that spooky midnight crowd who loved Rocky Horror, um, only problem, um, well actually several problems, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> this wasn't a horror film and had nothing to do with Halloween whatsoever. <laughs> Secondly, it wasn't really an adult film and was made for more of a family-friendly PG audience. Third, it wasn't given the chance to reach more of a large mainstream crowd as the studio insisted that they would skip all the trials and errors of the last release and drop it as an instant cult classic by design. They tried building hype through a documentary titled The Rocky Horror Treatment, but critics and audiences were worn into it, and the film suffered a worse fate than Rocky did when it was first released. So now it's time for the real question, did it deserve it? Did it surprisingly live up to the eventual success of its predecessor? Well, let's find out. <laughs>
We catch up with Brad and Janet, who have been married and are still living in Denton, which has now been taken over by the food sponsor, Farley's Flavors. And all the residents are being controlled to take part in DTV Studios. They're either part of the staff and crew, the audience, or the cast. And look, they even have a nice uh, little motto, the home of happiness. Fucking bullshit. Here they are force fed the most traditional messages, an image of the American dream life, and all new products to make the world better and a happier place, stress free. Brad and Janet sign up on a game show called Marriage Maze for couples who have been having issues. You can take part in the fun to restore your lives and win big prizes. I got it! Basically, it's, a, it's supposed to be a commentary on consumerism in the 80s. They both get called to stage and sing a ridiculous song about capitalism. Brad and Janet are taken off set and meet Dr. Cosmo McKinley, played by Richard O'Brien and his sister slash lover, uh, <laughs> Dr. Nation McKinley, played by Patricia Quinn. Turns out that they're here to treat Brad from his toxic relationship on the series Denton Vale. Meanwhile, Janet gets swept up and modeled into the next big celebrity for the network, and I couldn't help but get big Phantom of the Paradise vibes. She becomes a singer and a proclaimed television superstar, all in an effort to take her away from Brad and focus on the most important thing, being famous and fabulous. Yeah, the movie also tries to touch on the world of superstardom and the destructive side of it. They drug her and pressure her into complying with the way the network operates while Brad is locked away and honestly doesn't really do much of anything, honestly. <laughs> Before long, it is revealed by the network's news anchor, Betty, and the head of social science, Oliver, that the whole thing is a staged production and the doctors are just character actors on a hidden camera reality soap opera centered around failing relationships as they're taken into a twisted and bizarre mental hospital of sorts. And then it's revealed which this is where things really start to go off the rails. So the sponsor of the program turns out to be run by Brad's long lost and jealous twin brother. But once confronted through a song that can pretty much just be summed up as you're evil and bad and you're so vain. <laughs> It's a bit underwhelming. Brad and the investigators and Janet are imprisoned, though soon escape and have a getaway in one of the prize cars, while the rest of the town's audience are sent off to switch out their roles, repeating the cycle of brainwashing the masses through the power of persuading them through TV and the possibilities of fame and fortune. The end. So yeah, the plot is pretty all over the place. Seems to be doing a lot of different takes. And that might be due to several rewrites and unclear vision that wasn't fully thought through. And while I wouldn't say it's all bad, it could be much worse. It's at least entertaining and you can tell that they were at least trying to reach some level of bizarreness that Rocky had. Not sure if there are many layers beyond the weird shit half the time, but it at least makes an effort to say some things about society and the entertainment business at the time, back in the then time. And when I mean then times, I also mean the now times. <laughs> I'd say a lot of this is still pretty relevant, just update TV with cellular devices. It's essentially trying to comment on how we have become brain-dead zombies who can't think for themselves and need the validation of a community or a crowd to tell them what's right and what's wrong. Back then, that was television, and now it's social media. <laughs> Brad represents those who challenge that idea and say, hey, this is bad, what's happening? This is all just manipulative reinforcement. <laughs> it's an extreme example, sure, yeah, but that seems to be the level and tone shock treatment satirizes all of its themes and how corrupt society has gotten, as lackluster as some of those messages may come across. Such as television. Remember that? Remember television? This film hates it. Not only making fun of the ludicrous ways in which game shows work, like, hey, sorry your relationship is failing and all, that sucks, that must be really emotionally upsetting, but here, have a brand new glow-in-the-dark toaster oven. It also features a kooky host that's just for sure on heroin. It's all so disingenuous. I'm surprised his name isn't like Jimmy or James or Ellen. <laughs> 
But that's not the only thing, because again, reality TV and MTV are also sort of pre-established here. I'm not gonna lie and say that they're doing a whole lot with these concepts beyond just adding some neat hidden camera perspectives, though it certainly is interesting, I will say. I think they explored more of this phenomenon in a more detailed and psychological way in The Truman Show, and that perfectly helps transition into some of the problems I have. For one, it tries to touch on many different aspects of TV shows, the culture around it, how it impacts society, and becoming famous overnight, how the industry controls you and uses you for their own gain, and that's all fine and hunky-dory, but man does it feel bloated, but also feels very hollow in a strange way, because the way that it's executed and paced, it feels more like, here's an issue in the world, let's mock that in a song or vaguely suggest how it's flawed, before then quickly moving on and forgetting it was ever even mentioned. It just, I don't know, it just feels kind of forced and like contrived. Like there's one song about toxic masculinity. It comes and then it goes without much weight or impact. It just feels like an easy, exaggerated way to say, yep, it's ridiculous. Okay, that's all. On to the next thing. Almost like they didn't know what topic they wanted to stick with or, or actually build on, but they already had these lists or songs written with these themes, and so they needed to like mold a story around those songs. But it sometimes just doesn't fully connect or add up very well at all, only ever scratching the surface. So by the end, you feel less like the ideas within the text and subtext were so rich and I can take a lot out of this, and more like, oh, that's it? Okay. <laughs> it has the setup, but not the payoff. For it being a musical, the songs are all fine, nothing particularly bad. Some are certainly better and stand out more than others, even if most were written to go along with Rocky Horror Shows His Heels, leaving some of the songs to feel out of place sometimes. I'd say my personal favorites are Denton USA, the title track, and Bitchin' in the Kitchen is amazing. Like, just the way they casually name off random gadgets that seemingly pop up as they explain how materials materialism is failing them. It's pretty funny. It's possibly even like the best scene, and I wish I was kidding. Most of the acting is good. I, I think Richard O'Brien is a great character actor. He just does so much with his body movements and voices. It's very strange and bizarre. Though I think what made the weirdness of Rocky Horror work so well was the stark contrast between Brad and Janet and the rest of the Transylvanians. Something that is very much missing here. It's just harder to get invested in what's happening to characters and a town of clueless people that I just, I just don't really care about. <laughs> and I don't know, but Brad and Janet, uh, I don't know if their actors were told to just convey as little emotion as possible, but they have no personality. Specifically, Jessica Harper delivers all of her lines in the most monotonous way, and like, I'm sure there's a reason for this, but I just, I don't know, it's never made clear as to why. Meanwhile, everyone else is kind of just like a cartoon character. It makes it difficult to relate to anyone or anything that's happening. In Rocky, they acted like this because they were aliens from another planet, but it also served as an example of progressive change and allowing yourself to not worry what other people think and just be yourself, you know? Be eccentric, do whatever, you know? Dress however you want, look how it, makeup, whoa! Here you really don't get like an explanation or like any idea as to why everyone is like this. But there is also a popular theory amongst some fans of Shock Treatment that it's all a part of a split-off timeline within the narrative of Rocky Horror. Essentially, after Brad and Janet got engaged in the opening scene, they never stumbled across the castle, they never met the wild characters we all fell in love with as we watched the heroes go on a strange journey of self-discovery. Yeah, honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if after the events of Rocky Horror, it would have ruined Brad and Janet's relationship. I mean, they did eat a guy's corpse after all. That's a rather tender subject. Oh, and they also got raped by a vampire alien mad scientist from another planet. My theory, though, is that Rocky Horror was all a show for the people of Denton. Some type of broadcast, like a Twilight Zone sci-fi special. Something that could help push the narrative that trans people are weird aliens or some shit. <laughs> it would definitely align with the rest of their propaganda strategies. That would explain why the doctors look like the same actors from that. 
but they just are playing a different role. I don't know, I think it helps at least add some sort of context, some kind of explanation. You could argue shock treatment was the first of its kind, and yeah, that's all cool, sure, yeah, but that doesn't make it the best of its kind. I mean, in terms of exploring the celebrity lifestyle and the dark, toxic side of the music industry, just look at Phantom of the Paradise. It seemed to understand the message it wanted to get across, and it did it so well. It didn't sacrifice its comedy either, and it seemed to blend its tragedy and humor so effortlessly, while also still having a lot of emotion and impact, as you watch the voice get taken away from the creator. But then by the end, they suffer a big downfall and die in a horrific way, because they both were destroying the paradise but in different ways. In all fairness, I understand Shock Treatment wasn't aiming to be a horror comedy per se, coming across more as an upbeat, campier sort of thing. I just think these subject matters work best when you put some sort of level of tension or fear or panic into it, show the cause and effect in a way that doesn't feel one-sided. But in conclusion, for what it is, I think it did have a lot going for it in concept. I just think it didn't quite stick the landing. I appreciate the way that it establishes its locations, the way that the town functions, and it does feel very unique. But the rest feels clumsy and a bit all over the place, as though you're mindlessly just flipping through TV stations, only catching a glimpse at what's going on each channel, not able to take away much in the process. Though who knows, that might have just been from production affecting the end product. Richard O'Brien has gone on record to state his dissatisfaction with the film. Uh, yeah, I wish, uh, it's, it's flawed. But it's, it's, <laughs> it is flawed, but I, I can see, I can see, uh, saving graces in it. And he did write a whole new script a decade later, which was going to be a true sequel called Revenge of the Old Queen, which apparently would have shown more of the planet transsexual and the galaxy of Transylvania, where we meet the old queen, the ruler of the planet, and the mother of Frankenfurter. She doesn't know her son was killed by Riff Raff and commands him to go back to Earth and bring her son home to take over the throne before she dies. Meanwhile, we see Brad working as an agent studying UFOs and artificial life and other government conspiracies. He ends up discovering that his boss, who is also his twin brother, Farley, taking some details from shock treatment I see, was part of the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Uh-huh, you heard me right. A popular in-universe film that was based on the real-life events of his brother and fiance Janet 15 years ago. Farley has a son named Sonny, who is apparently a global pop star. Might also be the son of Janet, though, through a shocking twist of events. The queen dies and Sonny becomes king. The end. The idea never made it past the draft stage, but has been posted in full on several fan pages over the years. A decade a decade later, now putting us in the early 2000s, Richard tried for the third time to get a sequel off the ground with a working title of Rocky Horror The Second Coming. It began as an idea for a stage show similar to the original, and if it would have been a hit, they would have crafted it into a full-length feature. The plot was similar to all the other projects, but again this fell through, didn't make it past script outlines and rough drafts. Less is known about this sequel concept, only one song was leaked hinting that Frankenfurter was going to be resurrected, and no further plans for an official sequel have been discussed since the mid-2000s. You know, at this point, let's be honest, that might be... That might be for the best. <laughs> and you know what also could be for the best? Leaving a like on this video and subscribing. I'd like to thank you, and yes, you in specifically, for watching this far into the video. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Also, thanks for 200 subscribers. We recently reached that, and that's, that's fucking cool. Thank you. And I hope to see you again real soon. This is Zenny, your host beyond insanity. Bye. <laughs>